Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay Moore. This is Greg Cruz. This is Dan. This Stone. is Dexter from the this Offspring. Is Nathan this East. is Sebastian Younger. This is David Lab. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Jalef. I'm Chris This is Dr. Bob Greenberg. I'm Laird Hamilton. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, I'm Mark Valley. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. And now, the Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero, Mark Valley, and Pete A. Turner. I was like, damn. If I could, if I could have, if I could have a play character that had that hair, just that three little thing, it made all the difference. Just that three little crazy. You, you're like the good guy. Uh-huh. You can't have like the crazy hair, no, the crazy uh-uh. thing going because people are going to be looking at you like, well, he's got. Wait, we're supposed to follow him. He's he's our leader, but he's got these three weird things. Yeah, sticking up in the air. Uh, I love the hair. Uh-huh. I, thought was I thought he was good because he definitely brought like a real resentment. And an anger to that part, which I thought was a lot different than his. Yeah. I mean, like the Rocky, he, I mean, Rocky, he was wonderful, but that was more of like a, like a sadness or mood. But he brought him, he brought a real anger to it. And it was, it was wonderful that it was a tragedy, that it wasn't like a, a you know, a stock mustache twister. Mm-hmm. You know, you could see that there, there was a, definitely a tragedy. Did you, so yeah. when I watched it, I didn't make the connection as an audience member that, he was the kid until way later. And I wondered what the movie would be like if they would have told us that or shown us that, you know, like, okay, the King does kill his brother and that, cause that little kid was just some kid in a park playing basketball. I didn't realize that he had a connection to the guy who was up there who was doing these misdeeds. Yeah. You were, were you playing on your phone during the movie? <laughs> <laughs> you're just, you're just, were you scrolling through Twitter, like yeah. on a real dim screen, just kind of yeah. hiding it, like on the download? Nobody of the, knows. Nobody knows. Uh, I, I thought I was paying attention. Uh, the person I saw the movie with. I did. Too. I did. That was a. That was definitely a reveal. I was like, oh. So you it's supposed early to, on. it's supposed. I didn't think it early on. Okay. I think it's supposed to. You're supposed to look back and go, oh, that was the kid. Okay. So okay, yeah. That cause I wanted yeah. to make sure I didn't miss it. And then, would the movie have been? Because then you would have known, like, there's vengeance coming. This guy has to avenge his father's death. Would that have changed how the story flowed? Because I thought that might improve what I saw, possibly. You know what? Is when you first, it definitely would have made more of an impact when you first meet the guy. Okay. Like when you first meet Michael Jordan's character, I just thought, ah, oh, he's wait, wait a minute. Yeah. There's two Black Panthers. He's just another guy helping out. Right. Or he's just another bad guy or, you know, a supporting character. Yeah. Because you had the other great bad guy, the South African guy, was awesome. Like, that was a good it bad was, guy. It was, a, it was an interesting script because it did sort of throw you in the opposite direction. Or you yeah. think it's going to be the South African. Yeah. Well, who should have been Oscar Pistorius? I mean, I really should have oh, been Jesus him. <laughs> if you're going to have a, a limb missing South, Af- they South should African. You <laughs> should have had Oscar. But the... Um, yeah, he, he, that was a nod, and then like, oh, he shows up. Yeah, he was. But a it was guy. a little harsh killing that woman with a latte, though. I mean, that was such a yeah. That was like a rough way to. That did seem over the top. Like, like yeah, you. He, he, she didn't take it. She's just because yeah. why don't we take it back? It belongs to Wanaka. Yeah. Wakanda. 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 I thought Wakanda was in Illinois. Wakanda. Yeah, that's like a town that's. Kind is there a town of Wakanda? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. It's kind of Australian, too. Yeah. Yeah, Wakanda. apparently they never said Africa the whole movie. They never said. They didn't? No. Did they show Africa in the uh, early part? I mean, just like the styles, but there was nothing in particular. They they were pretty hmm. aware that they were just tossing it around a little bit. Did it not show, like, was there not a shot of the globe that as the meteor? The... It was Africa, you're right. Okay. It landed somewhere near like Botswana or something. And your African geography is better than mine. <laughs> I just know it wasn't the top. It wasn't the bottom. <laughs> it was one of those ones where I don't really know where they are, so it must be like in the middle somewhere, yeah. Yeah, yeah, somewhere where... There's... North of South Africa. North of South Africa, but not as far north as like Sudan and Egypt and Chad and those places. No, no. Okay. Yeah. I don't know. I like Africa's the... Africa's a crazy... You ever been there? Well, yeah, I mean, it's so big, it's like, 
uh, yes, I've been to Africa, but I've the not. The continent of Africa. I've yeah. been to the continent of Africa, but like being in Egypt, you know, or on the Sinai, like that's technically Africa, but you're not like in the jungle. And you know, like I've never like, taken a, a gunboat up the. Up the up. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Like I've seen a bunch of Arab dudes in pyramids. You know, I've not, uh, I've not had like the what I. That's, I've, I've been to the Middle East, which is. That part of Africa. Okay, I haven't been to much of them. I was in Jordan once. Yeah. It's hot there. It was hot. It's all bleached. Yeah. The city is completely that bleached That was the up. one thing. You were talking in your uh, episode with Robin Dreek, was it? Which one were you talking about being in Hurt Locker? Was that... Uh... No, that was uh, Tim. I, hold on. Which episode was that? You, I don't know. You were talking about being in Hurt Locker. And uh, as a veteran in that movie, the thing I thought they got right was the coloring and the hot, like how hot it was, you know? Right. Because it's just, the heat is just, uh, and you've been there, so you know, like it's just oppressive. There's no avoiding it. It's like, holy shit, it is always going to be hot. And the air is just heavy and dead. You know what's you know more disgusting, though? Huh. These little, they had these little connexes that we had to wait in. Yeah. These waiting rooms. And um, they all had backed up toilets. Ugh. And yeah. every, it was like, go to a little room. It's either like you go to this air-conditioned room that smells like feces. Right. Or stand out in the shade and just, you know, <laughs> waft yourself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, going to the bathroom in a lot of the rest of the world is really less pleasurable. I mean, it's... Isn't it? Yeah. yeah. We had an, an infantry company was at an area off of the Tigris. And if you didn't go to the, so like, you know, there's as a pace to work, as a pace to food, and that causes everybody kind of have a pace to, pace to bathroom. And if you got caught up out of, out of line with everybody else, that thing was filled. It's a porta potty. So it's filled with bugs or it's just filled, you know, <laughs> one of the two. So you had to like, you had to carefully plan your movements, you know, or deal with the unpleasurable, you know, alternatives of bugs or i've been watching this show berlin babylon berlin on netflix and there's one scene where the this one person escapes by um hiding out in an outhouse this is when the plumbing is sort of in like the back room so he's in an outhouse these guys kill russians come in and they shoot everybody in the outhouse they open the door and he's not in the outhouse i think he escaped and then the camera goes like down in the hole oh boy and there he is like up to his neck in it and you know it's fake but yeah. Oh. Yeah. That's it, when you. I mean, I don't know. Do you like? Is it worth it? It <laughs> it definitely creates a response. We got off. Have of, you ever been in that situation where you're like, it's a life or death thing, and you're doing something that you would never, would never consciously uh, consider if if I'm you weren't under threat. That that's true. Yeah, because ethics change in battle. Absolutely. So there's no doubt that that would be the case. I have made, uh, with Johnny Walker, when we were pulled over at what could or could not have been a a legitimate checkpoint, which at the time was a valid concern, uh, I had made the decision to shoot everybody in front of me if things escalated any point. Like I had my finger on the trigger on a live gun, loaded, safety off, and I had some pressure on it. Not enough to shoot, but I was ready to shoot. Yeah. And uh, that's a terrible position to be in that I wouldn't have normally done, you know, and I I didn't know what the outcome was going to be. So that was terrible. But you never had to jump into a flaming trench of shit. (laughs) I don't I can't. Nothing's (laughs) jumping out at me. Nothing's jumping out at me like that. No. Yeah. We did, though, at one point, (laughs) our office. Uh, Porter John somehow got removed from the route for the sh- the shitter sucker truck. Right. And so, and you don't know that. Like, there's not a memo. Shitter, su- <laughs> shitter sucker. Yeah. The That's shitter, name of it. I don't know. Whatever you call that thing, the shitter sucker truck. The shitter sucker truck. Yeah. And so, uh, you don't find that out until all of a sudden, you know, your Porter John is getting more and more full, and then you think, what's going on here? Oh, they're going to come by today for sure, you know? Or did we fill that thing up? And then the next thing, you know, like, that thing's all the way full. <laughs> and there's no solution for a couple of days. Uh, that sucked. You didn't have to go in it, but it was hard to avoid it, you know? Like, when there's literally a mountain of poo and it's brimming above the toilet line, <laughs> you know? You're like, oh, God, this it's is horrible. It's bubbling. It takes a life yeah. of its own. You have to name it. Weren't we talking about the same thing where we were interviewing Scott? Maybe. Using? 
Yeah, maybe. Somehow we, yeah, somehow we started talking about the, the flaming trenches of... Oh, of because people refuge. had to burn shit all the time. Yeah, that'd be and horrible. that's a terrible job. And it's always lower-ranking guys, especially, and luckily for everybody else, there's always someone dumb enough to continue to get in trouble, and that becomes part of their job, you know? Yeah. Because there's, you know, you've... You've commanded troops. There's just always there's always someone that's going to volunteer to be the dumb guy. Like, hey, I'm going to go do some stupid shit because someone's got to burn this poo. You know, <laughs> like, why did you bounce this check? Seriously, come on. All right, you're going to have to burn shit for the next 45 days. Oh, damn it! You're going to be burning feces. What would it take to make you go back into the military? To go back in, like or assuming... government service? Like, say so you're like, ah, this podcast stuff is fun, but um. What would it take? You know, if the nation needed. That's saying you're not you're not yeah. doing it already. You're not available. Yeah. No. What I mean, are you a not? What do they call it? A knock on or something? Is that the secret non-combat? term? Non combat. I don't know. No, it's a knock. Oh, a knock. Uh, right. Where you're just like, some... hey guys, I'm available. Oh yeah, yeah. I don't know. I, I'm not any kind of database like that or anything. But like, if they needed something, not like you know, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger mid '80s needs something. Like, if we need something, send helicopters and and you know. Talk me into it. Nothing like that. But like, you know, if there was some kind of major conflict and I thought my skills would help, I, I guess I might consider going. I, I just, I just thought of a great promo for like the Break It Down show. Oh, yeah. nice. That's right. I've always wanted to play a general, you know? Uh-huh. So we have a general. He's in a stinky Connex or something uh-huh. in the office. And there's yeah. whoa, 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 helicopters and dust blowing by the windows. We could fake all this, yeah. right? And he's this general. He's just looking over all these like bright and gleaming like like a map that's actually come alive, <laughs> yeah. you know, and there's just like red dots everywhere. And, uh, you know, they're like, they're like, General, the mullah wants to talk to you. And he's like, oh, I can't talk to him right now. And he's like, we can't figure out what's going to happen. I don't know what's going to Anyway, they think, like, I can't talk to that goddamn mullah one more time. Like, what are we going to do? And he's like, there's only one man for this job. <laughs> and then it cuts to Pete in his truck, like driving uh, along, talking on a phone. Yeah. Right? Talking or sitting in a podcast with yeah. a bunch of comedians just laughing, having right. a good time. And so like, his phone blinks. He's like, hold on, this guy's. You're not going to believe this, right? <laughs> <laughs> that would be hilarious. You're not going to believe this, guys, but I got to I, I gotta go. It would be a good funnier die sketch because then when I get there, you know, like one of the things I always do when I go out to outlying posts is I bring ice cream. Like I'll grab the two, like the, like the bring, five five I used gallon to bring things. Pizza, but yeah, yeah, I bring those because you know those guys got no need for me. But you bring, and I've literally heard the conversations because those guys don't hide their contempt. They're like that motherfucker that makes all that money. And then yeah. the E seven looks at him and goes, "You enjoying that ice cream?" Because he knows his job. You know, and then they're like, "Yeah, man, I love this ice cream." He's like, "That guy brought it." So the 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 button for it is like, you know, whoo, the door opens up, uh-huh. right? and there's like the helicopter lands, like yes. sh- sh- the door opens. Yes, whoo, it's backlit with you with these two things underneath uh-huh. your arm. It looks yes. like they're explosives, right? Uh-huh. Yeah. And then you cut to the general, like you know, putting his putting his spoon into some ice cream. Yes. <laughs> All right, put the moolah on. Thanks for coming by, Pete. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that's exactly what it should be like. Thanks for coming by, Pete. Yep. Don't mention it, sir. <laughs> Ice cream man's always coming Can by. Can you go talk to these guys? Yeah. That'd be cool. I played a... Um, a but that's before. sort of a fantasy, you know. Yeah. That they, they want you back. It's like, no, we got somebody that knows half as much as you, but he's younger. He's younger. He's more available. <laughs> he's um, more available. And he's, he's not going to tell the truth to other colonels. Because I'm really good at pissing off the non-commander colonels. Because, uh, you know, I'll say things like, you can argue with my analysis, but you can't argue with what I saw. And they're like, you dick. Motherfucker. You know? Yeah. Like, hey, you talk, if you have some input, I'm glad to receive that, you know. But your guy did roll his eyes at the governor. And when you say that in front of the commander, the commander doesn't have to look at the other colonel. The other colonel is already being looked at, you know. Right. He's like, you know, and I try not to say those things in the room, but when you aim your gun at me, I'm going to use my truth ray, you know, and shoot him back. So uh, that's hard to get people to accept that. Yeah. You know, because I'm the bearer of bad news a lot of times. Like the, I had a, it was one thing I was, a lot of things I don't really remember, but I had this commander who said... I wanted to propose something. He's like, listen, I'm going to give you a tip. If you want to like influence me or convince me or anybody above you in rank, yeah, here's how you do it. And he gave me a list of things to do. It was like four things. Yeah. One is um, 
um, appeal to uh, doctrine, uh-huh. personal experience, or common sense. Right. It was just include, he goes, next time, next time, just include those three things. Address those three things next time you want to convince me that. Yeah. Whatever you, your your platoon needs to go to the beach or something, right? you know, yes, yeah. You guys just convince you know use yeah. those things to convince me. It's like all right, cool. Yeah, it is that simple sometimes, and and they the commanders will tell if they have respect for you and they want you to figure it out. Someone will for them, or that person will say, "Look, your slides on PowerPoint they're fine, but the commander hates the color blue, and so every time you put blue on there, it's distracting him." You know, like like that. I've had like those kinds of instructions. Like, he he hates the explosion icon. He hates it. Don't put that on your slides, because he's not taking you seriously. You know, <laughs> like it's that that detailed when yeah. you try to communicate your message. It's pretty funny. So, what about you? What are your what are your short term and long term goals? Uh, I'm trying to get a couple other podcasts off the ground. You know, because there's some revenue in that. And then hopefully uh, get some stability with the income because it's just so hard. Like it just poof, nothing happens for a while, and then it'll happen, and then it doesn't happen. So trying to flatten out my curve, and then once I have some stability there, I think I want to try to write this screenplay that's in my head. Now a lot of it's kind of done, but I have to do the hard work of dropping the words onto paper, mm-hmm. you know. And and uh, and and I don't necessarily care that it gets made. I just want to be able to say, you know, I've written a screenplay. I've written a peer reviewed journal article i've written you know i've done these things why not a book of your experience i haven't figured out how to what kind of book it needs to be um and i don't know that i'm interested in a memoir so uh is it a business calling card am i applying the things i've learned to business is it going to be um, i thought a lot about like turner's wars and like what is modern war and describing that because i see a lot of it um but you know you want to write a book that doesn't sell anywhere write that book, you know, because someone's got to give a damn. And, uh, the book thing is hard because you've got to get an advance. A guy in my position, I can't just write a book on the strength and, and know that it's going to sell because I don't have an audience to do that kind of thing. So I've got to either find someone willing to give me an advance with the same problem of like, who are you going to sell this book to? Or I've got to self publish. And that's just a little bit too frivolous for a guy in my financial position to do. So book, a book would help me make more money. But I have to withstand the uh, writing process, you know. Well, you've been really effective in teaching me how to how to be a more effective interviewer oh, for thanks. a podcast and all the technical stuff, which is pretty pretty simple. You still haven't showed me the audacity thing. I don't know how to get two files and to sync them up. Oh yeah, and okay. to tell what's doing what. Maybe you could show me that at some point. I'll show you. But um, yeah. Yeah, I, I think you should just yeah do like a do an infomercial do like not infomercial but a web a web uh. Which I'm gonna call it, because I think it's fascinating. Like you know, teaching, like interviewing technique or talking technique or mm-hmm. te- or a podcast or what do you talk about? How do you talk about it? Um, you know, from the perspective of of you being in an environment where the information or what people are saying, like yeah. what I'm saying to you right now, it's not. You're not like listening to me with that kind of like, well, I'm going to need this. It's going to help me on the ride home. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> it's like Mark is just talking. I'm listening, yeah. you know, but to be, have been in that experience, been in that environment where what someone is saying has life or death consequences makes you a, probably a better listener. I'm going to, I'm just guessing. You have to be, you know, you have to internalize. And I think I've said to you before, like tabla rasa, like I've got to clear my slate and understand. I don't know anything about you or what I think I know about. Otherwise, I'm coloring my own picture, not yours. So from a guy from who's hosting, who's spying, whatever, I need to know what you know as much as possible, as much as clarity as possible. To do that, you have to listen better. I have to think of all of the... Wait, wait, what did that guy look like? How tall was he? Where do you think he was from? You know, and I need to understand what Eastern European people look like versus uh, Irish person. You know, and all these, all these things are in the background behind that to help me process what this what this person is, what their accent was, all these other variables. And I have to know to ask those questions. And I can't do that if I'm not listening to what's there. Yeah. But I think I just can't, I just can't see how that experience or the, the intent, the intensity of it couldn't give you like a real window into, um, you know, telling people how to, how to conduct an interview, you know? It yeah. It seems like a, it seems like they're related. 
They certainly, they certainly are. What the, my failure is, is finding, uh, you know, the clients that are like, man, I'd love to ask better questions. You know, like here's, everybody's got to figure it out. You know, it's a hard thing. I mean, you do feel like, you know, it, and then like, I can read a report from an Intel person and I can see the conversation that they've had. Cause I've had so many of them and I can say, you weren't in control of this, uh, this interview. And they'll tell me that they were and I'm like, okay, well then why didn't you ask these questions in these spots? You know, and I'm doing this in the kindest way that I can, but I'm being very critical of their work. And then it hits them in the face, and now they have to be defensive. And like, well, it wasn't about that. Or, you know, well, then what's this report about? Because you've missed the pieces that need to be there. Um, that's hard, because people don't want to hear that stuff. But there is a way to do it. I don't know. I just have to figure out what the uh, what the wrap is. Well, I think you're just gonna, yeah. I mean, you're probably just gonna. My prediction is you're just yes. gonna have a, you're just gonna have a few very successful podcasts of other other people. You know what I mean? Yeah. And you're gonna be in the background, you know, Master nodding puppets. and guiding. Yes. You know what I mean? Yeah. The the podcast Zen Jedi Master guy. He's the podcast. Did you get the nod from Pete? Yeah. <laughs> it was good. <laughs> the nod. What's going on? Yeah. We're going on the air. Nice. Yeah, a lot of people are doing podcasts. They are. But what do you? What, I guess this. Uh, I guess yeah. It feels like the conversation. It feels like the interview just ended. No, Didn't you it? can ask me another question. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I guess the, my thing was. I think was why is um. What is your? Uh, how do you know? A lot of times people say, well, whatever the story is, this idea you have that the idea will dictate. When you start fleshing out the idea, that'll dictate the medium. Is this a screenplay? Is this a movie? Is this right. a TV series? Yeah. Is this a poem? Is this a podcast? Right. Right. Yeah. And like you hear something, somebody said that they, um, there's a podcast about a guy who bought the contents of a storage uh, yeah. garage. Right. And from that, he started to look through it and read these letters and he turned it into a podcast. Right. It's like, why is that a podcast? Yeah. Right. What right. is it about that? What is it about that? That's one of the questions. So people say, how do you monetize? And that's a great question. But more importantly, how do you build an audience? You know, how do you know when you've got an idea? So the Break It Down show is a great show. I mean, we get great people. We, you know, we build really compelling stuff. But there's a thousand podcasts that are like that, you know, and, and I think our show is honestly better than Bill Burr's show, you know, or Mark Maron's show. But not better enough that it makes a difference. It's not about better at that point. There's something else that's missing, you know, and obviously having a huge audience like those guys have, they, they get to do whatever they want and they get to say they're doing it right. So I think it's it's finding something that works. Like we're doing these, I don't know, we talked about it before, the album fight concept where you take two albums and you just go song one against song one, song two, song three. And people can't control them. It's like they have to participate in these conversations. That's more like this this uh, storage locker thing. Like people are compelled, even whether they listen or not, they have an opinion on what's better, Van Halen one or Billy Joel 52nd Street. They're going to tell you what they can't. They can't help but say, no, 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 this is better. And then, like, well, they, we, here's the opportunity to listen to us discussing that. So I think that that's the thing that people have to figure out, and you don't know. You don't know. Like, it's it's a – I'm stealing this from Anthony Ian Arino, but you don't know. It's like swimming. You can read a book about swimming, but until you get in the water and do it. Like, you've, you've learned about Live Drop and what it might be, and it's still emerging – so you can't just say it's not this because we, we just don't know. You know, yeah. we don't know where yeah. the next opportunity is going to come from. Yeah, I guess I guess the question was like there there are podcasts that have a specific storytelling nature, and yeah. then there's some that are like a general interview. I mean, I, did, I wonder are podcasts actually going to be these things that you are, are that podcasts going to become like hashtags, right? Where all you have to do is type in a topic, yeah, and then it'll be like. All these episodes. I think so. Yeah. All these episodes were about that. Or is it going to be? Because I just don't really feel. For example, I was just listening to this one podcast, and it's pretty popular. The guy he talks about these historical stories. I don't want to say what it is, but I'm listening to him. Like, oh my god, he's just going so slow. Yeah, this is so. Like, Did you listen to this podcast? I'm like, oh, that guy's voice drives me nuts. Yeah. You know, like whereas one person, it's maybe it's great content, it's structured really well, right. you know. But I, even with cereal, you know, I mean, I love the stories and stuff. But after a while, Phoebe started to get to me. Yeah. The, Hi, this is Phoebe. I'm like Jesus. Yeah. She feels like she's in your shirt pocket. Yeah. Hi, this is Phoebe. I. Uh, Hi. I, Hi, this is Mark. I'm back I with struggle Pete. with there's all that, like, of that stuff. There's that, that like whispering. I'm right here with you. Hi, you know me. 
Uh huh. I'm here with you, and I just want to. Oh, I definitely that creeps me out. That there's that New York Chicago podcast public style. It's entirely too soft for me, and I reject them right from the start. I work past it and through it, but just like I want to grab those people by the neck and throw them because they're so meek and small and tiny. You know, like that's my visceral reaction. Obviously, I'm not going to do those things. <laughs> it's but like, it's like Pete, Pete. I have another question for you. <laughs> <laughs> but even you sound more like Pete. You know, <laughs> Uh, and, and like when they tell these stories of being uh, hi, like, I was in the army once, <laughs> and we had to do something. We had to burn our we had to burn our feces. Right. It was really a drag. I we going to talk to Michelle uh, Rigby Assad on Monday, and she's got a bad case of imposter syndrome. What's that mean? That's like I don't belong here. I, everybody here is better than me. They're all going to find out that I don't know what I'm doing. Was this in her book or your personal? This personally? is in her book, and uh, you know, cause she goes to the CIA, and they have all these, you know, this this prestige and everything. She's like, I, I'm just some girl from Florida, you know. And, oh right. And so there's a lot of that stuff, like with uh, Ira Glass and all of those guys. And they've done it. They figured it out, and they do great work. But they all have like this: I need a therapist to make me believe in myself. And you know, like as a combat guy, I'm like, all right, listen, <laughs> I'm gonna throw you through this wall. You can believe in yourself. You know, just go out and do it. it it's uh, it's funny because it's dumb for me to like not like someone because they sound like they might be soft. You know. That's interesting. Soft. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He's, he's kind of soft. Right. Softness. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the other thing that podcasts are going to become is, and brands haven't figured this out, but any brand that has a content base, whatever it's going to be, the Dodgers, if you don't make a podcast about your brand, someone's going to grab your brand and make a podcast about it. It's on TV shows all the time. There's Star Wars podcasts where people just say, let's just make more content based on this because everybody loves it. Oh, right. So it's an imitation of other mm-hmm. of other stuff. Right, right. Yeah, well, your, 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 your album fights. Yeah. Right? I don't get it. I don't. Right. I know, I know you do. I know. <laughs> I'm like... They're two different albums. It's two yeah. different people. Yes. <laughs> how, how are they? But it's kind of. But in a way, I see the. It's like it's like the little claymation fights they used to do on MTV. Right. Yeah. Like Eminem would fight like Elton John or something, yes, yeah. or like David exactly. Bowie. And they come in and just. Yes. And you kind of laugh about it, but you are taking like other people. You take their memories, like that's that's junior high for me. I, I had to hulk up to ask out, you know, Mary Sanders and ask her to dance. And you just said that that, that beat it was better. You're fucking wrong, you know. All right, I'm looking up Mary Sanders right now. Is she on Facebook? <laughs> no, I made up that name completely. <laughs> yeah, yeah, was not really she's not even on my Facebook list. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah I, mean, I think that that's what it's about. Like you take an album that sold 20 million albums, and then you. Don't say you don't say that it sucks. The whole idea is to have people enjoy more music, but to say that one is better than the other, people just have a, a automatic resp- like my response with the softness. Like I am compelled to feel this way. I have but to slow I down. Think like Pete, uh, uh-huh. I think like Pete. I think like what you're saying. I know it's really important, uh-huh. but I just uh-huh. really have a hard time because sometimes I don't. I I, I don't. Uh, a lot of my friends that don't know what an album is, uh-huh. so <laughs> we just think you sound like really like you're talking about old cars, which yeah. is fine, but we don't drive them very much. So, so I'm gonna tell you one of the things I've noticed, and, and you, that's a <laughs> and great example. And I don't example. mean to go over the end when I'm talking, right. but <laughs> right. it's kind yeah. of or you go slow and do the voice fry. I don't right. know. Uh, they don't say I think; they say I feel. Like, I feel that. Uh-huh. I feel uh-huh. Pete, that. Yeah. That's a trigger word for me. I'm I like, feel. You feel. I'm gonna show, I'm gonna show you. Show. <laughs> oh my god! That, that, that podcast I was telling you about. We should do that. Like <clears throat> next time we co-host something, we're gonna start it out. Mm-hmm. And we're gonna do it like those girls on a, or away with something, whatever yeah. the name of it. But but they um they say how they feel. Uh huh. Yeah. And I and I can't. If I'm podcast, if you got an interview and you're talking about somebody, I can't even stand it with like a. I don't even like the 15 seconds of a how-to YouTube video where it's like, hey. How you doing today? Yeah. You know, I thought the other day, I thought, you know what? Why not show somebody how to, like, put an extra spout 
you know, and dig that in, you know, or right. whatever it is they're just, they're talking. I'm like, I don't want to know you. Yeah. I don't want to hear just your tell me how personal. To do it. I can see you. You're a person. I've already judged you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't need to hear who, I need you to tell me who you are. Right. I've already made an assumption. I already don't like you. So just <laughs> tell me what you got to tell me and get it over with. But every podcast they start out with, they say, okay, how do you feel? Yeah. It's like, you know, I feel good. I feel empowered. I had a really good day. I bought this, oh, you know, I bought this yogurt yeah. that a friend of mine told me about that was really good. And last night I went bowling and I got a, a you know, I, my score wasn't that good, but everybody that I was with, we just had a good time. And it wasn't important because we were community. We weren't like in competition with each other. And, um, you know, I woke up and I realized that I'd already done the dishes the night before. So that like kind of made me feel a little better. So I feel, I feel hopeful. I feel empowered and I feel <laughs> yeah. very grateful that we're all here together. And, yes. um, and this goes on for yeah. like five minutes each, yeah. each person spends five Too minutes long. telling yeah. how they feel. And then like 30 minutes in, they hit the topic, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I don't, uh, I struggle with that. That's but, the biggest, I, I, you know, I struggle with, I struggle with podcasts and that you can't like say something back to them while they're talking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's definitely times. Uh, Joe Rogan, when I listen to his show, and I try, I've been listening to him trying to work on like what he's doing, trying to collect more tools and stuff, because he's gotten a lot better. Oh. But there's uh, just the reps. He's got well over a thousand shows now, so you're a thousand hours of hosting. I mean, imagine what you, how much you'd improve. Oh, time in the chair. Yeah, yeah, time in the chair. So like he, he just, he's, you know, the conversations that you have, and they're backlogged in your head, and you're like, oh wait, these things link together, or these things are like items, and so he's just become a better host. Before he was, I don't want to say he's a dummy, but he's just kind of just didn't have enough of that stuff in the catalog to put things together. <coughs> So now he's got that stuff and he's figured out kind of where he needs to be. And I'm being hypercritical of a guy who's already a great, great host 500 episodes ago, but like where he's at now, I'm like, Oh, I have to pay attention because he's getting to places that I don't understand how he's unlocking these levers and knobs. He's twisting. This is not a combination that I'm familiar with. You know, like his dojo has something that I'm interested in. He's got a long set and he's got a lot of stuff to call back. Yeah, right? and they're three hours each episode. Are you serious? Yeah, it's hard to get. It, I can't get through, and he does like one a day. It's just constant, constant, constant. I, I did Kevin Pollock's show one time. That was like three, two and a half hours. Was it hours. really on yeah. camera too? Yeah, and you forget you're on camera. You're just sitting there talking with Kevin Pollock. He's yeah, just a really good listener. I remember I was just I was just telling stories and I was just rambling on yeah. and having a good time and he's very present with you and un, he doesn't judge. He's got all he's uh-huh. got all of Robin's principles. You yes. Know? You know, but I did hear Joe Rogan. Did you hear him talking about Tony Jeffries thing? No, uh uh-uh. uh. Somebody somebody was saying was talking about how they he's like, Yeah, I started working out again. You know, I went to this place, I went to this Tony Jeffries got this great place called Box and Burn down Santa Monica. I've been working out down there. This episode of the Break It Down Show is brought to you by Lions Rock Productions. That's us. We publish, evaluate, and develop podcasts just like this one, consult others to build their own, and create associated content and content marketing strategies. So if you're launching or expanding your social media presence, your business, or your personal brand, or if you just want to take your media presence to the next level, reach out to us on Twitter at Pete A. Turner or at John LG 69 at the Break It Down Show. There's a thousand ways to get a hold of us. Now enjoy the show. And I don't know why he did it. He might have thought the guy was doing a free plug for the show. Uh huh. And, and Joe goes, "Wait a minute, what's the name? What's it called?" He goes, uh, "Box and Burn." He goes, "Okay, I, I don't care. I don't care who works out there. That is a, that is a ridiculous name for a boxing champ. <laughs> you know, who who trains there? Like Jane Fonda, right? You know, Box and Burn. Box and burn. <laughs> <laughs> and the guy's like, the guy's like, no, it's a good gym. I mean, he's like, this guy's like a world class, world class fighter and contender. And Joe just keeps going, Box and Burn, Box and Burn. <laughs> and I thought, well, at least he's he's a good interviewer, but he's not afraid to like give somebody give somebody shit. Every yeah. Once in a while, you know. Yeah. And that's where I think you worry about. Like, I don't even want to put. I don't even want to share anything on Twitter because I just think like, oh, I immediately picture. Yeah. You know the people that aren't gonna. I don't know. I I I imagine. I mean, I imagine like one of my 300 followers is gonna is gonna <laughs> not like it, or I'm like, oh, yeah. I don't want this to say this because I can automatically. That's another problem. It's like you get older. You, like you were saying, you just become a little more relaxed, but. You know, I can just, I can just hear the opposite. I can hear the other side of the argument. Yeah. 
Yeah, and and definitely I try to be aware of that with guests. Like I wouldn't want to put you or anybody else in a bad position because I say something that's that puts somebody unfairly in a box where they have to say something dumb, you know, because that's just a that's just not kind to the person you're talking to. And in this time right now, like I I'm not saying anything bad or good about President Trump. He's doing the job, you know. If you want to comment on that, call me offline or whatever, you know. But uh nothing's binary anyhow, you know, like to say he's universally terrible. That's just not true. And to say that he's a hundred percent making America great again, that's just not true. So, uh, I just try to find that middle road and kind of hit the ball back. Like if that's true, then, you know, how about this? You know, if the second amendment is outdated and outmoded and we need to change it, fair enough. Let's work on that. What other amendments are in the same boat? Because a lot of them are really old, you know? Well, I mean, they, they created new amendments for human rights. Right. They just made new ones. Yeah. First Amendment. What are the ones? What are the other ones? You know, like, think about free speech and how different it is now. Like, did they mean for anybody to put out any hateful, evil shit that they want on any form of social media and buy an ad to spread it? I don't know. Maybe we need to look at the First Amendment. And it's it's not meant to be denigrating the Second Amendment updating thing. It's just to say, if that's true... Then is it, that's kind of how I handle those things, you know. If we're going to say that mentally impaired people can't have guns, then can they vote? Like, if you're so crazy you can't own a gun, do we want them voting? And then who decides that? Or joining the military. Or joining the military, or whatever it's going to be, right. Yeah, like, it's not as simple as all of these things. So, I don't know, that's kind of how I approach that stuff. I don't know if it makes anybody happy or just pisses everybody off, but. Pete's pro Tom. Pete's, Pete's pro Trump. <laughs> That's what he's trying to say. In a very, in a very diplomatic way, he's a gun-toting uh-huh. Uh-huh. Florida, Northern Central Californian, yeah, right? Trump supporter. Yes. <laughs> I'm a, I'm, I'm a, what am I? I'm a pro-life. They got to have that too. He's yes. a pro. He's yeah. a pro. Yeah, it's just, it's a strange time. Yeah. I was just talking to my doctor the other day. He's this old guy. He's like, tell me. I, some I get some old person's skin thing, rosacea, whatever it uh-huh. is. You know, your skin gets like, yeah. oh, I'm an old person. I thought it was shingles. Uh-huh. So I went to the doctor and I'm thinking, oh, I got shingles. The whole way I'm driving there yeah. thinking I should have glaucoma glasses on. I'm so old. I got shingles now. <laughs> it's over. I mean, right. it just felt like it was over for yeah, me. You know, yeah, yeah. it's just, you know, don't even worry about what you're wearing anymore. Yeah. It's, you're done. But I got there and he said, no, you've got a rosacea or something. I was like, oh, all right. That goes away. Don't worry. It's not contagious. So I said, oh, it's great. At least I don't have shingles. I felt like I was 18 again. Yeah. <laughs> but he's, um, he was like, yeah, Trump's doing a great job. I think he's doing a wonderful I, job. Yeah. And you know what? The stuff that he was saying, he was saying, you know what? Uh, people in Korea, the, for the very first time, the North Koreans are actually checking what they're saying because yeah. they think that he's, mad, he's a madman. You know, that he is the, he's the crazy guy in the bar that you just don't. Yeah. If he's there, fine. Just don't piss him off. Right. That's what he wants America. It's Trump's idea is that's what he wants America to be. He wants America to be the crazy guy in the bar. Right. Not the not the guy who's going to break up the fight or the one who's going to talk people out of fighting. Right. He wants America to be like don't don't talk to Sam yeah. after 11 cuz he's wasted and we don't really know what he's going to do. <laughs> yeah. Just just let him have the fucking peanuts. It's much easier. Yeah. Just give him the peanuts. Just give him the peanuts. It's it's so much easier. Well, it's like the thing with uh, South Africa. You know how they're running out of water. Like they're they're counting the other days because they just don't have. They haven't had any rain, and and they're only people with money who can ship water and have water. We can easily set a cup, uh, you know, a task force of navy ships over there and just desalinate water and pump it out there. Maybe not leave all of it, but we certainly could do a lot. You know, and that would be something that a lot of other presidents would be like immediately send someone over there to, to provide help because we can't have people on the earth not without having clean water in this kind of a situation. We can't fix everybody, but this we can alleviate. He won't do that, but he will send a carrier group over to Korea and say, all right, and and get China to pay attention and get the Philippines to quit being dicks. So you do have to give him credit for that. And I'm not a pro-Trump guy at all. I'll just say that honestly. But Sorry about that. No, 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 you're fine. <laughs> yeah. But when he does run, like if we spend time talking about how fat and dumb he is, and there's people in Indiana, and Michigan, how bad he looks in those white yeah. golf pants. He's going to be able to go to Ohio and say, "How many of you have more money in your paycheck this year than last year?" Right. How many people from the last few presidents got Amazon to invest hundreds of billions of dollars in this nation and create more jobs? 
how many people got Apple to put $350 billion of their own money back into this nation and build stuff and like, holy fuck. You know what that means? Yeah. yeah he's a fat, dumb guy who's going to get a lot of fucking votes. Yeah. How stuff. many pieces of legislation did I have, you know? Yeah. Yeah. He's going to be able to do first. that. So we've got it. We, if we don't like him as a president, we've got to get serious about actually, you know, stop mocking and start actually. I know. Doing stop things. being so excited that he's, I mean, if it's like, oh, he's this, he hates women, he's racist. I mean, the, sure. Yeah. You know? Right. But those aren't the things that are going to stop him from, right. you know, stop him from getting this. You're the folks that are already not going to vote for him. <laughs> now you got to go convince someone who's like, I've got $45 a week more on my check. Yeah. Uh, convince that person. Well, he's not nice. Like, At what price? Yeah. I mean, maybe the, sh- I mean, the short, yeah. the short term, sure. Maybe he gets some people to stay back. You know, some business to stay in the United States, but, um, yeah, I mean, the more he closes America off, right. Yeah. The, the, the cheaper the labor is going to be somewhere else, the more incentive it's going to be for people to go somewhere else. Yeah. You it's... know, but those are, those are complicated things that I don't even understand that I can't really <laughs> communicate. I don't know why. I, I don't know. Yeah. But but you have to be able to have a conversation like that to go, yeah, you know what, maybe I ought to stop posting stuff about how bad he looks in a tennis outfit. And, uh, and you know, have some conversations that are actually productive with people that... You know, I mean, if, if I was a Trump supporter, I would suggest that he wears something else when he golfs. Sure. You know, I, I'd go for the short hair. I'd nice. just cut it right down. Yeah, you know I mean? mow it. Lose a little weight. Mm-hmm. I mean, imagine if his last three years in office, he, like, lost weight yeah. and cut his hair short. Right. They'll give him like two more terms. Easy. Easy. <laughs> he can just be as much of an asshole as he wants, but they'd be like, you know, yeah. you're going to have to cut down. If you could pick the person, anybody who's alive right now to be president, who would you say, oh, you know what? I'd give that guy a shot. Oh, to be president. Yeah. Not like Joe Biden or someone like that. Like someone you're like, no, no, no. I, I want to see this person and what they can do. I thought Joe Biden would be a bad pick, but. Wow. I mean, you got Mark Cuban talking about it, The Rock, Tom. Hay. All these people are like, maybe I could do this job, right? All these people are kind of throwing their hat in the ring. You don't got to pick from them. But if you'd be like, I'd be curious to see what they could do. Is there someone that stands out? Chase the Statham. <laughs> He's not a native born American yet. I'm the president. Yeah. Uh-huh. Joe Wayne. It's Jason Statham to be president. I'm trying to think. I, I don't know. I saw three billboards. Uh huh. I thought it was really good. Yeah. Um. I think Frances McDormand. I would like to see what she could do as president. <laughs> Honestly, she just seems like she's got it together. Yeah. All her movies, you know what I mean? She's yeah. compassionate. She's angry. She's strong. She's stalwart. I'd like to see what she has to say about a few things. Like She's that. not always running off at the mouth. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Yeah. That's I mean, very sexist. She's not running off at the mouth like women do. No, she's not. You know what yeah. I mean? She's, she's keeps. Yeah. I, th- I think Francis McDormand would make a great president. All right. Yeah. Someone that can spend time listening and building consensus. Those would be two really neat things to see. You know, like when, and this is not an indictment, it's just a state of affairs that is across the board, not something that makes sense to me. When the president stands up and says there are more black people employed than ever have been, ever, and that's whether you want to say it's a fact or not, I don't care. When half the room won't stand up just because of who he is, that's not good for all of us. You don't kind of agree with the man, but when he says something that seems like good news to a lot of people... And you just mean mug him as a as a form of protest. We gotta get we gotta be better than that, you know. You have to have somebody with a cap with an with a ability to understand and to empathize, and then to like communicate that empathy as well. And yeah. the way you do that is you have a genuine understanding, or even a visceral feeling, of what this other side has experienced, and then sure. to be able to to communicate that yeah. Trump doesn't do it at all. No, right? he's terrible at he's it. He's terrible at it. He's like, you know, I know you just, everybody's excited. People are just too excited. You know, yeah. um, there's such an easy way to, to, I just think there's just an easy way to do that. It's like, listen, you know? Yeah. I, I, I understand. He does more, he has more unforced. I understand this most, and he doesn't have to have a, but the problem is he has such an ego. He can't say, 
I don't have I don't have a solution to this right now. Yeah. Right? He can't just say, "Listen, I I I don't know, I don't know what it's like to be able to grow up with with guns in your hand or to feel like you to feel like you want or you have 12 of them that and that somehow constitutionally that's your right and that yeah. you know, we, we have a difference of opinion, but I I um I know what it's like to feel that something is important. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Or even if you did it a different way and you were just like a a commander in chief type leader and you just said i'm the executive branch i'm not the legislator but what i can do as the executive is i can hold those legislators accountable and we're going to go get to work and we're not going to focus on anything you know, whatever it's going to be and it's like this is what's going to happen and this is not going to be and i know a lot of them kind of say it but i mean to say it so that we're all like all right cool yeah you know what we can all take a little bit more to if he's going to be on this and really push it you know but it Whoever that person is, we haven't seen that person in a while. And to have some reason with it. I mean, I just feel like Mike Pence is just so far on the other side as well. I mean, yeah. you know, I just think that we have to, I don't know, I can't do his voice. I sound like Bill Clinton. That was like Bill Clinton. Like, wait. Uh, I think Bill Clinton should come back. I'm going to I'm gonna come back. Uh-huh. Pete, it's funny. You should ask me. I was just thinking about it. You know, I'm a vegan. Yeah. I don't think Clinton would be a good president again because he's a vegan. All he would do is he'd be like, I know we have some problems in Korea. We have some challenges in China. Yeah, the Pacific is is this is hotbed of fundamentalist uh, fundamentalist excitement right now. But um, I'm a vegan. I'm going to tell you what I had for lunch today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had a hamburger made out of. <laughs> I had a hamburger made out of grass today. <laughs> grass and broccoli made made out of my neighbor's grass shavings. Yeah, <laughs> and it was the best thing I ever had. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's. I hope we get someone that's. Uh, that's more healing next time. But maybe we got to be hurt enough to be able, allow some healing to happen. Because we sure do seem like, like like we're just mad at each other, you know? Yeah, yeah. I think Facebook is going to get, they're going to start getting away from, um, I mean, this was happening before. Before, well, but actually before it was, before Facebook, it was regional, right? Yeah. I think, I think one thing that Facebook is going to do is that you're going to, f- is that you won't find people. I mean, it just felt like before Facebook came along, there was the people who lived in the cities, yeah. and then there was the rural. Yeah. And no matter where the south was, where the blue or red was, it was just kind of gradually moving towards, you know, there were the people that yeah. were rural and people that lived in the cities. The cities were becoming more and more liberal. Yeah. It's because they had to be tolerant to function. And then um, the, um, you know, rural areas... They could tell that every meeting they went to, every basketball game they went to, every they were talking to like-minded people. Yeah. But now that you have Facebook, there's a two-way sword. On one hand, you can be a uh, liberal living living in a rural community. Yeah. You know, you, you watch Bill Maher. You can listen to that. You can kind of control your feed, even though all these lunatics around you right. are telling you one thing. You've got your little thing. So it's it's funny. On one hand, it does. You have this kind of virtual polarization, but it does enable people to geographically live wherever they want to live. Have we reached a point in time right now, at least for the you know the next however long, where no matter who the president is, 20% of us are going to want to impeach that person and hate them regardless of what they do? And I, I don't mean just like we don't agree, but like people hate it. George the Younger. People hated President Obama. People hate with a passion president trump and seek to o- undermine and overthrow these guys have we have we seen like is that always going to be the case or do you think we'll get past that and be more i don't know uh not so intolerant i mean before nixon was there really much clamoring about impeachment right. i mean everybody's like well we're stuck with them yeah we're kind of, but then again back in those days you couldn't really do things quite as quickly i mean yeah but I mean, before Nixon, I remember because I remember Nixon. I was like, "Oh my God!" I still remember him getting on that helicopter and thinking, "Oh my God, our president's a crook." <laughs> I was in third grade. It was what the hell is going yeah, on? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The drunkest guy in the bar is the guy going, "I'm not drunk. I'm not a crook." I like, never did that. I was never wrong. <laughs> I never lied to the American people. And he just like got on a helicopter and he was gone. But um, and then would President Trump be as? received as poorly if he wasn't so profitable for media outlets because you have to cover him in all things you do like it's just he he sells soap you know is that always going to be the case or is that just because of his unique 
grand approach to the world. Well, if he's so, people are still buying it, right? Yeah. And I think it to the point, I guess it's, you know, he is a, he's a, he's a brand and he's a commodity and he's, he's reliable as a, as a news source. Yeah. Right. And, but the moment that becomes, I was just thinking about that the other day. I was like, man, imagine, you know, you know, when they drag out the old presidents every once in a while, yeah, they see what yeah. they say. Like, that's just like 10, 15 years from now, like, well, we're talking to former president right. Don, Donald Trump today yeah. about what he would do. And you think, oh. I wonder what that's going to be like, what he's going to say, or yeah. what, how people will look back on him, what, what they will, what they will think. Yeah, I, I'm not a, I'm not a real fan of any of the recent presidents, but I can see President Obama being a great ex-president if he focuses on what he can do within his influence circle, which is massive. He can really have, he could take on major things, and I wish he would focus there. I don't have the same faith that Donald Trump will do that. Like the Bushes have their thing. Like we don't talk about other presidents for the most part. You know, we. I'm going to sort of, paint. Yeah, I'm going to paint. I'm going to hang out with my grandkids. Actually, George time. W. has said a few things. No, they about said, Trump, yeah. yeah, but they didn't say much about President Obama or anything else. They they mostly keep tight lipped. Obviously, Jimmy Carter doesn't really get too involved in those things. But I just don't think we're going to get that. With President Trump, I think he's going to continue to be, well, he's not going to go away from the public light. I can't imagine that that'll be the case. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) It's just like him. But you have to admit, though. Now, I heard somebody talking, talking on CNN. They were saying that. I mean, this book Lieutenant Colonel Grossman wrote, this on killing, right? Mm-hmm. It's like, in, well, it, it was this crazy percentage of people that actually fired at another person. Right. And then the amount of training it takes to be able to just, to just simply shoot at a, a target shape like a human. Yeah. Not even like a real human being. Yeah. And then to be able to, you know, to have your training to the point, I'm talking about like being able to handle a gun or in, in an environment when your adrenaline is going and how it changes your eyesight and your viewing. And that also degrades your accuracy as well. Yeah. Like the amount, you can just give a teacher a gun. I mean, yeah. the amount of training that goes yeah. into making somebody efficient and think about like, I, I get nervous when I go to like a gun range, right? Yeah. Because right. it's like, these dudes are like holding on. It's, it's like kids. I'm like, I grew up where a computer was as big as a house and I see people walking around, and I see people walking around with their laptop and just acting like it's a, like it's a graham cracker and just putting it down like this. And I'm like, yeah. do you realize the power yeah. of that thing? But you also see people that are just handling, yeah. you know, you know when somebody first sees a gun, yeah. the first thing you want to do is pick it up and hold it in their hand like it's a toy. And you're just like, oh, yeah. you knucklehead. Yeah. But, and you see people doing that and that. You know, I mean, your teacher has a, dude, your teacher has a gun. Yeah. Yeah. And teachers have bad days. <laughs> Just <laughs> FYI, you know? Yeah. Yeah. We, we had a teacher in our hometown, for whatever reason, she made the decision to bring a bunch of weed brownies to not a school function, but a, a, a party with school people at it. And kids, school kids were there in addition to people. And she made national news because like they charged it with poisoning people. It was weed brownies. But, I mean, think about that. Like, she could be the one in class that has a gun, and she's about to maybe lose her job, and she has a a really bad day, you know? I mean, who's to say teachers aren't going to go on a rampage now? Yeah. Like, remember, workplace violence was a thing, a real thing for a while there. Like, going postal wasn't just a joke. It was actually people snapping. And so we got past that. I don't know what, what it took. But, yeah, there has to be things. We actually had... Well, the principal's going to have to have a gun, too. Like, how are you going to tell your yeah. teachers, like, listen, you know, we have, I want you to I want you to, uh, <laughs> I want you to change this curriculum or do yeah. this. Like, oh, really? Right. I got a gun. There's an insurrection at the school. We had, uh, yesterday, we recorded, or two days ago, we recorded an interview with a SEAL named Ty Smith. He's from San Diego. And... uh my buddy Paul was also a veteran. Good SEAL name. Yeah, no, Ty Smith is bad. We didn't even mention the kill the killjoy being a, a Navy SEAL. First <laughs> yeah. of all, he yeah. went to the Naval Academy, which right. I'm like, no, 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 this guy is not a Naval Academy mm-hmm. graduate. No, you can. <laughs> yeah, that was wrong. I ignored that part. I'm like, that's not who this. They guy always is. throw that in. It's like, well, where's yeah. the best place you go? He went to the Naval Academy. Like, Naval Academy. No. Yeah, he, you he can't went to be Hayward that. State. You can't be that single-minded. Yeah. 
at a, at, a, at a military academy. You have to be able to do a bunch of different things. To be able to get through the military academy being that angry. And then what was his sport he played? And then he was he a Navy rugby? SEAL who clocked up kills. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was a little... Yeah. He played rugby? That's what I'm saying. He has to play something. Like, you know, because... It's an academy. Like you, I forget what you played. Mate, you, yeah, what, what did he do? Was he in the glee club? Right. Was he in the choir? <laughs> yeah. Like, what did he, who was his roommate? Right. Did they get along? Was he a guy that compiled demerits? Was he bottom of his class? Wait, I want more information. Yeah. Where did he go on spring break? Right. Yeah. <laughs> was he just trying to kill people? Was he like, in the glee club? That's <laughs> hilarious. <laughs> what did he do? So, Ty, we asked Ty, because what Ty does Because you know what? When I was at West yeah. Point, the dudes who were like, this is serious, like, I'm going to go special forces. I'm yeah. going to take martial arts. Everybody just kind of stayed away from them. Yeah. The ones who were like, this is serious, gung-ho. Right. Well, you know the guy. Yeah, absolutely. Every unit's got that one guy who's like, I'm a fucking killer, man. Yeah. <laughs> like, sure you yeah. are. Sure you are. Clean yeah. the fucking tr- to the train. Yeah. <laughs> light, the, light the turret on fire. You dude. realize <laughs> you're in the logistics branch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Like, get me some toilet paper. That's your job. You, re- you realize, yeah. The uh, so the thing with Ty Smith, SEAL, he's retired, and he does like security for workplace and schools. And so, like, we have here, we have a guy just by accident. This thing happens, and he's able to talk intelligently about. Wow, it. what do you say? Yeah, and we did again. I I didn't approach it from the right says the left said. I said as a guy that knows how to shoot, and I can shoot someone. You know, in the heart, like piece of paper, 10 feet, 15 feet away, which is pretty good with a pistol. I will shoot you in the middle of your heart. If you give me less than half a second, I can do it. And I'm not proficient like he is. I said, from your point of view, do you want to take that shot? The chaos, the adrenaline, all of those things. Like if you shoot targets and you have a pistol, try walking in place and see how hard it is to shoot and hit something. It's really, really hard. So here I am in this crisis environment with people running everywhere, all these variables, and I see a guy, and how often are you within 15 feet of this guy? Like, he might be 150 feet away. You know, you can't shoot him. I can't shoot that guy. Yeah, I'm not Wyatt Earp. I don't have a 12-inch barrel on my gun. And I asked him, and, and I'm like, what does it take for a teacher? I don't want to put it on him, but what does it take for a teacher to be proficient in that kind of environment? And he basically talked about driving the weapon. You don't hear people on the TV talk about driving a weapon. If you want to drive a weapon in that kind of environment, it takes it, 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 and it was all clinical, you know, and you don't hear the president talking at that level or none of the people that are like teachers need more guns because here's a guy who is a pro who could handle that situation. And he says, you know, you can't, you have to choose one or the other. You have to be a teacher or you have to be someone who can handle that situation. The other thing I talked about was, okay. So what is driving a weapon though? Driving your weapon is taking your weapon and controlling it to the point where you can't engage someone like that. Like you are in charge of this weapon. This is part of who you are. You're not shooting going, did I hit it? And looking like this is, yeah, absolute control. Right. Put the stick. It's there. It's there. there. Right. Well, you know, the whole thing of like pulling out of your holster, rotating. Now you're in a combat position. You come up here and then you push forward. Those guys practice. They get to the point where they can shoot from here. Boom. Well, they're like hitting here, things. Right? Yeah. Well, it depends on who you learn from. But sure. basically, you're trying to get that thing rotated, pointed towards the target, and then the guys who are great at it are already shooting the moment. Can shoot reliably from the hip. Basically. And they're not looking through the sights, but that, that, at that point... Mm-hmm. They're training. hopefully... Uh, the way I learned how to... It's like you're hopefully out of bullets by the time you reach full extension with your arms and then putting in a new magazine. You know, because even if the person is respond, but this is someone who's sending a lot of rounds down range with a bunch of kids running around, you know, with, so, with what, like what, I mean, like the average, what's the percent, like when adrenaline is going like that, I mean, the, there was like a percentage of rounds. Yeah. Somebody said it was like eight, it was something crazy. Like if somebody's at 20 feet away. Yeah. It's like one out of five rounds are right. probably hit. Right. It? Yeah. Honestly, I think that's yeah, the, it's some of the be. best, some of the, the, the best guys. Yeah. And you have to teach that person to, because you have flight. Or women. Yeah, right. Fight, flight, or freeze. And that sheriff in Broward County didn't respond. He froze. He froze. So you can shame him for being a coward, but you blame the sheriff, you know, for not being a leader and saying these guys need training so that they respond in the right way. Because freeze is an appropriate response to danger. You know, you yeah, get to do that. Yeah. So we talked about that. And it too. can be an effective one as well. I sure. Mean, That's what camouflage is for, right? Like, yeah, you freeze. Yeah. That's my that's my go to response. <laughs> By the way, if we're ever in a situation, I just want to let you know ahead of time, Pete. I'm a freezer. I freeze. Yeah. I I I, I turn into like 
like, oh my gosh, there's not even a human being. Why right. even shoot? It's so completely still. But your brain is like going, yeah. I'm the dude you talk to like after 15 seconds have gone by. Right. Mark, what do we do? And uh, then I'll probably have an answer for you. Do you want to try freezing? In the first, <laughs> no, in 15 seconds, maybe like a minute, maybe like a couple of minutes. You might have an idea, yeah. The whole thing's probably over, it probably would, but like ask me two minutes into the into the conflict. Yeah. What we should do next. And I will have, I will have a full slate of options that make complete sense. I worked up an algorithm. Of how to get, how to get out of it. It's like, I figured this out. <laughs> I want to say this other thing it's about Ty's happened. thing, too. I'm like, okay, so if teachers can't have weapons, what's the best weapon in this case? Is it a carbine? And basically it is. It's something that's small but has some range to engage. And I asked the other hard question, because this all kind of goes against what the left wants, but it's what has to be there, is can one person reliably defend a school in these horrible situations? And he's like, we have a saying, and I'm going to say it wrong, but I'll do my best. We have a saying in the SEALs, Two is one, one is none. So if you have one SRO or cop oh, right. there, I've heard that right? before. Yeah. yeah, like you don't have anything. That person can only do what they can do, and you can't reliably defend that. And then it's not just shooting. It's being involved with the kids to be eyes and ears so that you can be approachable. You know, Pete can have ice cream. Hey, I got ice cream. You know, and people will come up and give me the tip that I need, you know. So I've heard of... I've heard of, I can't reveal my sources, uh -huh. but I've heard that, um, like at least in, in community colleges and some colleges, I don't know, uh -huh. that there are FBI agents that could. are actively talking with teachers and instructors, using them as like hmm. informants if they have any students that act any, yeah. a little bit out of out of the... Um, I think a lot of that stuff is kind of anti-terrorism stuff because like universities sure. are targets, yeah. you know. But what if they had that sort of system in a, in a high school where it's like a a system of? Well, the answer to that question is we already have that system, and my, and Paul was also in, in on this conversation that we had. He said we have this. We have a national database. We don't like that in this country. I mean, in a lo I mean a localized one. It's like, yeah, here's our. I I think like your your school psychiatrist uh -huh. needs to be your school like <laughs> counterintelligence guy. <laughs> yeah. He needs to be the one talking about like you know Rub, if anybody yeah. acts crazy. Yeah. You know. But the thing is, is we have that system and it's largely automated. We just don't trust it. So we could have something that's tracking phone calls, text messages. All of these things can be logged into a database that isn't run by a human, but alerts and says, hey, these just things. It's an alert algorithm. Things. Yeah. This right. one kid talks mm -hmm. about guns a lot. He's angry. He uses a lot of right. da, 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 da. Right. Just like how we find terrorists. Like, hey, this money's moving in a weird way. Attention, FBI. Attention, CIA. So we have that system. We just don't like it because we don't like that kind of big brother feel. But th there has to be a trade-off at some point. You have to either say, we want the power of this robot that can find... Because they'd be so much more effective than a gun. Yeah. Right? I yeah. mean, nowadays they have... You know, If you walk into a concert at Staples Center... Yeah. You'll probably be screened through facial recognition. Yeah, and if not now, within five years, for sure, that's constantly going to be. There the are case. some huge venues now, or at least yeah. the European ones. It's like they're scanning the crowd for yeah to match facial yeah, recognition you have for to. stuff. You have to because you can't rely on a metal. Detector. I can get by that metal detector. I mean, I don't, you know, but if if I wanted to do something horrible, I could do it, you know. And in, in a venue like that, it's it's too inexpensive to not do it. Because what happens if they do? I mean, that concert where uh, in Europe where they shot up the uh, that young girl's audience. I can't remember what her name was. Demi, not Demi Moore. Damn it, she's old. But uh, uh, Demi Lovato, isn't that who it was? Yeah, yeah. You know, like that can't continue. No, but that's not good for Live Nation. That's not good for Demi Lovato. Clearly not good for humans at the concert. You know, no one stays in business if it becomes dangerous to go to a concert. So they'll spend the money on that. And that that exi not only exists, it's getting better. Samsung's going to have robots up in the air. That sounds crazy in 1984-ish. That's reality. Those things exist, and they're going to keep track of everything. Yeah, I mean, that that movie where they would predict who was going to be a, a criminal. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it's so possible now. I mean, you just look at somebody's like browser history. Yeah. The things that they like, the things they don't like. You know, you compare that, you correlate it with. Yeah. You compare it with known criminals or killers or people who have kind of gone unhinged like that, and suddenly, you know, you're gonna. It's not like you're convincing someone. Oh, you're gonna do it. It's like you know what? 
Um, Jason, we're yeah. gonna have a little talk because yeah. you uh, you scored pretty high. <laughs> you got a high score did really on the well. wrong on the wrong did really sub- well on the wrong subject. Yeah. You know? That minority report idea. But that is true. I mean, we're looking at all of these things like x-ray tech is going to get better because a computer can look at every x-ray ever done and dramatically improve our ability to see what is and isn't a problem. I'm surprised to be, I have to admit though, I'm surprised there was only one phone call to the FBI. Like, like they were satisfied that one, one call to tip somebody off was going to somehow get through that huge bureaucracy. I mean, wouldn't you just want to like... And whenever anybody, I don't know what it is. It's like, well, yeah, I don't know yeah. why there weren't a dozen different people calling in. And I, uh, I, and actually, I want to talk to Michelle about this on Monday. But at one point, I was on the Bay Bridge, and there was a car in front of me. And every time they went by an upright stanchion for the bridge, around the lower deck, uh, a camera flash went off. And and it wasn't the angled ones; it was just the straight ones. And I'm like, okay, I talked to my friend Jeff. I'm like, uh, Did you say stanchion? Whatever you would. Uh, you're the engineer. That's what, awesome. That's what, awesome. Is that right? Yeah. Okay, good. Yes. No, I have no idea. Okay. <laughs> I wasn't believing you. It's a caisson. Okay. It's a caisson. It wasn't the. No, I just made that the up. The caisson's the main thing. This is. These are like like the the every like I don't know twenty yards. There's one, you know, and they're upright and they they hold the the two decks apart. Anyhow, so uh, they're going across. Stanchion's they're, pretty they're taking cool. a, a picture. Each time, and I tell my buddy Jeff, I'm like, if if this goes on any longer, we've got to go up and pass by these guys. And and to be honest, I said, if these guys look Arab at all, I have to call. Like, for what I do, who I am, my experience, you know, if it was a bunch of Irish dudes, I, I don't know that I make the phone call. We get up there, and it's it's Arab dudes, and I'm like, all right, well. So why are the why are the cameras going off? It looks like they're casing the bridge. Oh, they're casing the bridge. They're casing the bridge, yeah. Oh, I thought th- I thought there were cameras on the bridge that were like... No, ch- it's in the van taking a picture of the bridge structure itself. Oh, so, right. So I'm like, all right, well, you know, it's probably nothing, but I I have to call. And only Jeff never would have even realized it, right? So I call and I report what it is. I'm like, I know it's probably nothing, but I'm a counter-terror guy, counter-intel. I understand how these things work. You know, and so they're like, okay, yeah, fair enough. Thank you very much. But that's the last time I hear about that case. Like if you report something bad on Facebook, you get a report back and they're like, hey, that report you made, that person, yeah. that person was actually not into you, you middle-aged old man, the girl with the big boobs, you know, she was fake. Um, but the FBI doesn't do that. They don't go back and say, hey, we checked that out and uh, it was important. Like there's just never, it's just a black hole. So you're yeah. right. So you report in like, hey, this kid's acting weird. I think every school should have, like, most there's there's like you know most likely to succeed, uh-huh. and then most likely to <laughs> to to do that. You know? Yeah. I mean, why don't why don't they, I, I really think like yeah. a a peer, you know, a, a like peer a peer evaluation, a peer evaluation. You know, like who is going to every school has to have like at least three three suspects that you need to keep an eye on. Right. Yeah. You know, it's a private vote. Just write the name on a ballot right. and put it and put it in the box. Right. Most likely to commit white collar crime. That's Chris over there. Most likely to rob a liquor store. That's already Carl. We know he's done one. And you just kind of populate it with that, like an ELO rating. I mean, most likely to shoot up the school. Well, you have to have a couple categories because you, know, you don't want like if you're going to do the survey properly. Like you have oh, wow. Well, like, you know. Yeah. You could be like most likely to buy a gun. Right. Yeah. Most right. likely to use it in anger right most likely to avenge an ex-lover most likely to listen to the guy who's buying a gun and say i'll do that with you yeah yeah <laughs> most likely clyde most likely bonnie yeah <laughs> has the most amount of black in his wardrobe they should right. <laughs> like you should be like hey we have some new categories for the right. yearbook this year right. here's what they are you know yes. likes to dress in black owns a duster owns a duster yeah picks his face Picks his face. Most like, actually, most likely to star in an, a Sundance independent film. <laughs> right. And as a, as a t- as an a teenager in angst. Yeah. You know? Yeah. A drug selling teenager in angst. It's funny that because that girl said you didn't. You know why weren't you nicer to him? She goes, you didn't know him. But I'm like, well, then you think, that, well, there must be this like an unwillingness to. Potentially ruin somebody's reputation. I mean, I mean, 
Yeah. I mean, they couldn't. I'm not saying anybody could have foreseen anything. Right. But why couldn't why couldn't they say, you know what? We think because nowadays people are so sensitive. Here's the thing: they're really sensitive. If you complain, if you complain to a kid in like a like a school, like um, one of those pay per universities, right? Yeah. If you do complain to someone about a student, or a parent complains about some other student, they don't waste any time. They're liable. They don't want to take a chance. They're like, "You're out. What? Yeah. You're out. Sue us. Go ahead." But a public su- public school system, I don't think. I don't think they can act on that sort of information. And look at the incentive structure. I don't want to make this always about money, but they're incented to get kids through to school and through school. That's what they're made to do. Yeah. So even yeah. Like, 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 no, no, we'll hire an adult to stand next to your kid all day long because they're special needs. And they'll go through the regular curriculum because that's what they're incented to do, you know? Oh, it's fascinating. I mean, because people, <laughs> I, I, I took around, I'm like, you know what? Here's the thing. It's like, I, I was kind of glad if there wasn't bullying in high school, I'd yeah. still be like feathering my hair like one of the Cassidy <laughs> brothers. <laughs> you know <what> I mean? <laughs> oh, wow. They needed to be bullied sometimes yeah. just to be, you know, Mark, that's not a good idea. Someone's got to enforce the norms. But, not, but it's interesting because like people are so afraid to bully other people that people can kind of exist in this in this sort of disconnected weirdness yeah where nobody's like dude what's your fucking problem you're yeah. bullying me no you're fucking being weird right yeah completely inventing up inventing a scenario but think about it <laughs> right yeah. like a lot that kid would have been does bullying cause that i mean there's different levels of bullying and obviously there's just the cruelty which you know there's no there's no excuse for but the kind of the way the kids sort of police each other in a strange yeah in, in a strange way yeah. you know yeah but does that have a it is a negative effect? Does it does it actually cause it, or does it sometimes would it actually, you know, bring bring attention to to someone? I think people are afraid of being a bully. One of the things about being a bully, is and I have no idea what it's like being you, in high school right now. Yeah, no, I'm just come completely. On. It's yeah. crazy. the The idea that there are all these bullies and yet nobody seems to own a bully. Right. You know, like oh, my kid was bullied. Like, what? Well, okay, great. And that happens for sure. We all were. But that bully is bullied too, so maybe it's not the right conversation. You know, if if nobody's like, "Oh, my kid's an asshole," he punches people all the time. <laughs> yeah, I got a kid. He's a bully. Yeah, and, and um... the other thing is, is and this is like in the olden days, but there was a thing before, like where a kid's life wasn't so structured, and you could go down to the school and play pickup football, not just basketball, pick up baseball, pick up whatever. Or you could just go run around the neighborhood. Like, I never see kids run around the neighborhoods like I used to growing up. And I drive around neighborhoods all the time. They just, you know, like, we were just in the street playing. Yeah. There was civility built into that. You might get picked on that day if that kid decided he wanted to push your buttons. But he might also get beat up by five other kids that are like, knock that shit off. You know, like, you had to learn some give and take. And even a kid that's an outsider is going to be a little bit possibly protected in that neighborhood, like football game. Like, Hey, we're going to throw the, the crappy kid, the ball, and we're not going to not include him because we're not all jerks. You know, like there's a kind of a mob mentality. You might also get your face punched in and everybody walking, look, you know, stand around and look and point at you. It just seems like the kids are not overprotected, but it's just, they're, they're so structured. It's teen suicides going up because there's all these expectations. You're not on the path. Why aren't you going to U.S.? You know, U.S.C. needs uh, like ah, chill out, go to prom, have a couple of beers on accident. You know, on accident. Yeah, nobody knows. That's funny. Yeah, kids are doing. They have to do so much homework now. It's crazy. Yeah, I saw a documentary one time. This girl was just saying, I, you know, wait, okay, I have to to get into a college. I have to like, I have to play in an athletic team. I have to take AP courses. Mm-hmm. I have to join clubs. I have to demonstrate leadership. Mm-hmm. Um, I have to be in student government. I have to play a musical instrument. <laughs> you know, yeah. There's all this list of things that you have to do. Yeah. And she said, and wait, and now I'm supposed to, to have time to be passionate about something right. else Yeah. and write an essay about it, why it's important to me. You know, what's important to me is like yeah. trying to meet this, this, this list of things that... It's just incredible. Yeah, quit making adults out of kids. Yeah. You know, that might also help reduce the shooting. Like, we're going to run out of batteries. Yeah, so don't give them... Oh, I think we did run out of batteries. Oh, we're done. 